Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the virtual chapter for uh, what month is this? January of some new year that I'm not entirely accustomed to yet, but I think it ends in a three, uh, starts in a two, and uh, 2023. Uh, uh, Happy New Year, everybody. It's good to, good to be back after the holidays. And I am Michael Watson. I'm here with my co-host, Karen Hand. Hello, Karen. Evening, y'all. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Uh, and we've got a couple of things that we're going to share with you guys tonight after we get through our calendar and some things like that. And then uh, the, the bulk of our time together this evening is going to be with our special guest, Mike Mandel. And we're really looking forward, Mike, to talking to you uh, in, in just a, a little bit. So uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Wonderful to be here. Yeah. And uh, it is wonderful to be here. So, so Karen, let's, let's look at the calendar really quick because uh, I, I got a note from Linda Otto herself uh, today uh, by text that says, don't forget to remind them that uh, registration has opened or is open for, uh, for the conference. So, uh, so the IFI MDHA conference, which is, uh, gosh, it's quite a while from now, it, it is the 19th, 20th, and 21st of May. But uh, it's uh, it'll be here before you know it. So registration is uh, is now open, and uh, all the all the stuff is uh, is being posted, and uh, you can find out all the details about that at the IAC uh, website or IMDHA website. Uh, you have a choice there, and uh, there's that. Oh, and and before the conference, Karen and I, Karen and I have a really special uh, opportunity to spend a little bit more time with you. So uh, that's going to be on Wednesday nights this year. Um, and so that that'll be a little bit different, and uh, we'll see how that all works. But uh, Karen, uh, oh, and, oh, and also, guess what? It's only going to be it's only going to be an hour, which is thirty minutes for each presenter. Uh, what I'm actually talking about, I just realized half the people on this call have no idea what the hell the topic is, but but I am talking about it anyway. Um, prior to the conferences. We run a series of, uh, of interviews with people that are presenting pre and post conference programs at the uh, at the Hypno Expo. So, uh, so those will begin. Uh, let's see. I'm I'm looking, looking, looking. March fifteenth is the first one, uh, and uh, there will be five five weeks of that. So uh, you'll have up until a month before the conference an opportunity to. Uh, Hear from the people that are doing, you know, the longer programs and uh, asking questions and find out what it's all about. So that's always exciting. Karen, what's going on in your neck? Oh, so while we're talking about the conference, I want to say mark the dates uh, 17th and 18th of May on your calendar. I know the conference starts um, 17th and 18th. Yeah, the conference starts on the 19th, but Michael said it will be here before you know it. It'll start on the 17th because Sherry Gilbert and I join forces. Sherry runs the chapter in Phoenix and we join forces. We're doing a two day workshop on the magic of metaphor, the language of the mind. So we'd love to have you join us for the two day pre-conference workshop. That's why I say it starts a little sooner. I think Michael's actually getting a jump on us because you're training <laughs> just ahead of us, aren't you? Yes, as a matter of fact. So, so I'm starting on the 16th, 16th, 17th and 18th and the 22nd and the 23rd is the master trainer training. So it's around the, the weekend of the conference and the uh, you know, the weekend of it is in the middle. So that's a, a five-day program uh, along with the conference, of course. It turns into an eight-day event. Uh, and uh, that's just uh, just lovely. <laughs> <laughs> he said that with the best of intentions. <laughs> you know what it is? I've had so many things going on. And so so by the way, this weekend, two days from now, is the uh, board certified uh, hypnotist uh, program for through IAC, and that's something that I run online. So uh, so it's a weekend for me. And uh, and neck and last weekend was uh, World Hypnotism Day. I got involved in some programs for that. Next weekend is the Elman Conference uh, as well online. The next yes. weekend after 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 this right. one coming. You know, uh, so uh, it's one thing after another, as Emily Latella <laughs> would say. Yeah. But uh, well, well, I want to be, I want, it. while we're on the element, I want to highlight the 20th because I'll be a featured speaker talking about one of my favorite subjects. Hypnosis is BS. So is NLP <laughs> for that matter. 
And if you don't believe it, join me at the Yellman Conference so I can explain. Hypnosis is BS. Join me there on the 20th. You got some explaining to do, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> and we're looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, so there's all of those uh, all of those things. Anything else on the calendar we need to know about, Kim? Coming up, yeah, ICBCH is in March coming yeah. up. Yeah. Um, lots of stuff coming up in the spring. You know, it all happens at yeah, that point. And, and I'll be graduating students coming up in March, March 1st. So I'll have new hypno babies entering the world. I'm presenting at I, ICBCH uh, as well. And I don't know exactly what the dates are. It's funny that you said that. I, oh, it's uh, March. I do because I've got a full day with my students there in Orlando, March 1st. So it's the second and third, the conference. And this will be the first time since I've known you, Karen, that you will have spent time in the same place as me in the same, you know, Orlando, in my, my own territory. So, right. A uh, couple of times this year coming up, actually. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, that's all that I can think of. By the way, Mike, uh, as long as you are, uh, are here and 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 are our guest, uh, and we're doing the calendar, you got something coming up that uh, people ought to know about? Not a thing, sir. Not a thing. <laughs> but our our next our next architecture hypnosis in Toronto which isn't until May. We're back after three years off because of COVID. And we were back and we started Halloween, did a five day intensive, and then we'll be back at Hypno Thoughts Live in Las Vegas, where we get to see all my wonderful friends, including you guys, and um, then back to UK Hypnosis Convention. But a man of my extended age just not want to travel too much. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, I, I've got the, uh, it, it, now that you say this, uh, by the way, having having been online for the longest time now, it seems, and uh, and the last class that I did was hybrid, like half online and half, uh, you know, and, and half live, and was really rather challenging, by the way, an interesting thing for a, for a presenter to figure out how to do, you know, I mean, I'm sure once you get it down, the folks that are, that are brilliant at it, but uh, it, it certainly was a task for me, and uh, you know, and I appreciate how well it how well it did work. However, uh, I have an NLP uh, training coming up, and um, there are two four day modules. They're in uh, in uh, March tenth through the thirteenth, and April fourteenth through the seventeenth, live only, no camera, no no video, <laughs> no on right on live <laughs> here in Orlando. Uh, we do have a couple during the course of that, between the weekends and before and after the weekends, we have a couple uh, evening things that are online associated with the program. And, uh, but uh, but uh, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having people back in, in, one, in one place. And, uh, and in fact, the last, the hybrid class that I did, I made some good friends. Uh, Renee, who's who's here online tonight, for example, was a part of that, uh, part of that group. And uh, yeah, lovely. So, you know, I figure if you want to teach people something and you can't smack them, you know, uh, then what good is it? So, so, so uh, you know, so, uh, so we got to get them in the same room and, uh, and that work out. So there we are. Uh, uh, we got a couple little feature things that uh, to talk about before we get started here. And uh, one of them, I'm just going to turn this over to Karen, except I will tell you it has something to do with the number three. Well, you know, before we officially started, see, you should get here earlier. You missed some of the good stuff. Before we officially started, Michael mentioned uh, John Grinder and wanting three perspectives on anything. Boy, three is a magical number. I'm guessing we got the sign of the cross, the Trinity, whatever it is, in threes for a reason, right? Um, I'm sorry, Mark. Yes, you are very good at <laughs> making that. And I am from my childhood being raised a Catholic too. It, it's hard to get that out of your system. Things happen in threes. Business things, hypnosis things as well. You know, in writing, they say uh, words, phrases, and sentences that appear in threes are funnier, more interesting, and more satisfying when they come in threes. The yes set can start with threes. Isn't this a wonderful night for the virtual chapter? Is it good to get together and talk about hypnosis? It's fun to learn something new, isn't it? Very agreeable statements. And when placed in threes, allowing you to agree like that, you're in agreement. So we've got easier compliance, building rapport, things in threes. In business, Boy, a good rule of three 
is talk about the other person three times more than you talk about yourself or talk about you or your company. Keep the focus on them. Talk about them three times more than you talk about yourself in suggestions. You can say, do it this way or do it that way, a binary thing, and it gives room for the mind to go, no, I don't like those choices. But you offer three examples and the mind can come up with even more and more and more. Yeah, we can go along with that. So the rule of three, a good rule to go along with, you know, was it Stanford that just came out a couple of weeks ago with the words you can't say anymore? According to their list, you can't say the rule of thumb anymore. You mm. can't say the rule of thumb anymore because the rule of thumb is a term that came in the olden days when you couldn't charge a man with beating his wife. You could only charge him with beating his wife if it, if it was big, if he hit her with something bigger than his thumb. That was the rule of thumb. And so, of course, that is offensive. So Stanford says you can't use that rule of thumb anymore, but we can still use the rule of three. The rule of three is a wonderful rule. And I've been using it a lot lately. And I shared this before in the chapter and I really wanna share it again because I think it's a wonderful thing to teach your clients in self-hypnosis, a very easy way to do self-hypnosis. I know a lot of people have an awful lot of steps that go along with self-hypnosis or ways to get into a state to go into self-hypnosis or whatever. I think this is just the easiest wide awake, also a trance, hypnosis, self-hypnosis that you can do. And it's based on the rule of three. I started this back in November, uh, thanks to Scott Schmerin, my friend, friend Scott Schmerin, who has for years been doing his three, his list of three things that he's grateful for every day for years. I know Scott and Scott's had some hardship, but there's a man that I've watched rebound faster than most people I know. And he truly believes, and I'm a believer too, that it's that list of three every day, <clears throat> looking for what's right in your life. Because even in those times of trouble, when you train your brain to go searching for what's right, what's good in your life, it becomes automatic. It becomes a habit and a habit for good, right? That's a great thing. So bouncing off Scott's gratitude list, I decided to issue to people that I send a newsletter to and, and uh, my students and such, the November gratitude cha challenge, every day listing the three things that you're grateful for. What a great place to start because it's not always easy for some people to start with, look for three things that make you happy. Some people will say, nothing makes me happy. Is there anything that makes you grateful? Can you be thankful for something? Let's meet them where they are and start someplace, any place at all. So, so for November, I started with the gratitude challenge. List three things every, every day that you're thankful for. And I do assign this to my clients sometimes and a little secret, Sometimes they have to do six things a day, three in the morning and three at night, because it's going to take a little more work for them to retrain their brain. They're so entrenched in the thought pattern. Regardless, I'm, I'm making light of this in a way, but it really is an easy, fun way to do it. I started with that November gratitude challenge. And at the end of November, it was so fun. I found myself being grateful, noticing things all day long that really made me feel good. So I thought, well, this will be fun. I'd like alliteration. So I started December delights. Find three things every day that delight you. And delights can be almost anything. We're into joyful January now. Find three things a day that you find joy in. And along the way, if you've got any suggestions for alliteration for February, let me know. <laughs> It's got to be positive. <laughs> okay. I thought of fucking February, but hey, I don't know what three things you're going to list. Okay. So we have to come up maybe with something else. So fantastic I, February might be okay. Fantastic. Yes. I thought of fantastic February, fabulous February, all of those things that you look at. And it really is true. I find that when I make my list every day of the things that bring me joy or did like me or that I'm thankful for, that all day long, I'm just finding things, little things, big things for which I can be 
thankful, grateful, joyful. It's a very, very simple way to retrain your brain for looking for what you want. Now, if you're working with a client, you got a weight release client, list three things today that will set you, keep you on course. Start off your day with whatever that challenge is. If it's more exercise, list three, three things today that you're doing for your body. I don't care how you frame it. Start the thinking process and watch how your brain naturally and automatically retrains to start, start sorting by what you want instead of what you don't want. The rule of three. It's kind of a fun rule to keep in mind. And when you're doing a presentation, I beseech you talk more about them than you do about yourself three times more. And you'll build more rapport and be a better presentation. Michael. I love that. I really, really like that. Uh, and, and and I'll tell you one of the reasons that I that I like it is that uh, and 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 I know there's a few people and again R Renee you're going to get tired of hearing me talking talking about this I, I keep talking about the reference librarian it's a it's just a model that that comes from a book by David Saint Clair some of you might have seen it's a paperback that came out in the uh, maybe even the late 60s or early 70s and it was called Instant ESP and David had all of these different little you know, one one chapter techniques and, you know, to change your life and et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but he made reference to this thing about the reference librarian and, and you've got to be a certain age. Mike Mandel and I know about this and, uh, <laughs> you know, and maybe Karen, um, uh, I'm sure Karen, yeah. When, so when I went to school, when I graduated from college, we still didn't have personal computers, you know? So, so back in those days, if you were going to write a paper, you would go into the library and you would look up, you'd find, look up, that's an interesting uh, uh, <laughs> slip. You would find the reference librarian and you would say, uh, I'm doing a report on the Hoover Dam and I need the information that you have. And she'd say, well, okay, give me a minute. I'll go back in the stacks and I'll get it for you. Now, some of us have this thing where we get really impatient. You know, I, I, I do this with the television all the time. I'll see an actor on TV and I'll, and I'll say to myself, I know that person who is that who is that and you know the you know the old language pattern the more poo looked for piglet the more piglet wasn't there you know there, there is no answer <laughs> who is it who is it until you stop asking the question until you back off of it you know and then five minutes later that light bulb you know comes on you know over the over the top of your head well this is how i think about the reference librarian and and and, and the deal with trying to remember that actor is like she says, I'll get you the information on the Hoover Dam. I'll be right back. She disappears into the stacks and you ring the bell again. So she has to come back to the window, right? And she says, what, you know, what do you want? And, and you say, well, you know, Hoover Dam, Hoover Dam. She's like, yes, I know. I'll get it for you. And she goes back into the stacks and you ring the bell again. So it's kind of an interesting thing. When you stop, when you wait, it gives the reference librarian time to do her work. And I think basically when you give any request to the unconscious mind and just forget about it, you know, you, you create the conditions in which that internal trans derivational process can, uh, you know, can begin to take place. And uh, uh, so, so I love having a, a technique like you've got to start your day with, uh, Karen, and to do the, to do the three things and, and like that. Um, you might remember me talking about the TV, the television mornings, because what I do is I, I have worked forever kind of on the second shift. My, my husband has worked that shift, now recently retired, so the whole world has just changed, but works that same, you know, worked that same shift. So we, we did everything in a different way than the rest of the folks in the world. When we would get up in the morning, the first thing that we would do is we would we would have our coffee and stuff and we would sit now forgive me for this but this is just just I'm, I'm telling you the tea you know we would watch uh the view then it became uh it became uh really contentious political times you know about five six seven years you know whenever you know and and what we realized was every morning we were sitting in front of the television listening to four ladies bitch about the conditions in the world and I started noticing that 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 it was having an effect on me, and I thought that's not that's not the way that you want to start your day. So I started watching Outlander. Some of you may remember this Outlander, this lovely Scottish drama through time, you know, time travel and all kinds of great stuff. But just a beautiful, beautiful love story. 
with, you know, a lot of drama and stuff, you know, going on in it. But I realized that as I watched, uh, as I watched that program, I found myself noticing more lovely things and how easy it was to, uh, to, to be more loving in my life and in my relationships. And I was just feeling better because I had started out with something, you know, something different as my conditioning agent. But then finally, I got to the last episode of Outlander and I'm like, oh my God, what are we going to do now? I searched and searched and got stuck on 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> now that's really terrible. And I've got to, I've got to tell you, it's probably the worst TV in the world. And, and, and the deal is it's a reality show where these two people, uh, they have got a K-1 visa for one of them from a foreign country to come to America and they've got 90 days, you know, to, to get married. And what I saw in that was different because I thought that it was the sweetness and the loving, the, the loving nature of the characters in Outlander that had really touched me. But now I noticed that these people were going so far out of their way to be obnoxiously unkind, you know, to one another that I realized how much easier it was, how much easier it was to just be good in your relationships with people. And in spite of what a terrible example it was, it ended up becoming this really interesting model because I'd find, I'd find people bitching and cra going crazy about stuff and trying to enroll me in some drama that had nothing to do with me. And I realized, oh, this doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't even need to have an opinion. Uh, in a world where every time somebody says something, everybody else votes. Uh, I thought, how nice to, to, to be in a situation where I'm not required to have an opinion, be upset, get enrolled, you know, or anything. And uh, so uh, it's all kinds of ways to get yourself started. But conditioning the mind, isn't that the thing that we're up to, you know, uh, and uh, and your technique, Karen, is really kind of a nice thing for that. It's so much fun to just notice how quickly it really does retrain the brain to give you what you want. Set your intention and do it. That's And if you want steps, there, you've got steps. Do your three every day. Trust me, you'll go into a trance. I want to tell you how much it works. Because tonight, I have just been completely joyful. It brought me joy to hear Mike Mandel call me a young woman earlier. And Michael <laughs> Austin say I might be too, too many. I might not remember reference libraries. Oh my God, I have no idea how old you think I am, but right now I think you put me back into my maybe my 30s. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> I appreciate you and we'll be joyful about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so you know, it is the first meeting of the year, and and we're uh, we're we're gonna get on with uh, Mike here in just a, in just a minute. So uh, I just want to make passing reference, at least, to the fact that uh, while we're talking about conditioning the mind, that uh, January first is one of those days when uh, people all over the world decide this year I'm going to be different. This year I'm going to be better. This year I'm going to you know, uh, and they establish their resolutions and um, or resolutions, as uh, as Karen likes to point out, and uh, and I think that's uh, that's a lovely a lovely way to talk about it. So I, I'm just curious. I I can't really see everybody. Well, I guess I can if I uh, if I go onto the view here. I'm just curious by a, if, if y'all would hold your hands up. If you you have New Year's resolutions, does anybody have a something going on for? Lisa, put oh, your hand up first. I saw it first. We yeah. would you, do. We have a few minutes to share, Mike. Mike? We have just a couple minutes. Yeah. Uh, if anybody would like to share what your resolution is, I'd love. We'd love to hear it. Didn't mean to hijack that. And feel free, whoever whoever it is, feel free. Just open up your microphone and uh, tell us what you're doing. It's so boring, but it's so necessary. I'm cleaning my garage. I am determined. All right. I mean, well, it's so dull, but there are a couple it. other pers private ones, but that one is one. And I'm taking action. I mean, I'm really taking action. So let's, fingers crossed. 
That's why I call it a re-solution because putting all the stuff in the garage was a solution to something in the first place. Now that solution's not working for you anymore. So you're looking for a re-solution. It is not working for me anymore. I have one too. I've decided I'll do all the things I want to do. So I made a list of five things and every day I put, I either do a little or resolve to have do a little the next day. So it, I keep pushing them forward, even if their goals are infinitely far away. You know, you know, uh, Lincoln, there's this, the, the, the best description of neurolinguistic programming, I think was offered by Lewis Carroll. Uh, when he said to uh, start at the beginning, uh, keep going until you come to the end, and then stop. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, because isn't that right? So somehow or another, I think that's the key here: is how do you get yourself to continue to take uh, to take appropriate action? Oh my God, I'm just having a flashback of Tony Robbins, who uh, you know back in the day, what was the thing that he said? Massive action, massive action, massive action was all over everything. I think that Tony ever wrote or or talked about. But really, I think it's just consistent action or 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 the the, the intention to continue is the issue. It doesn't have to be massive. So, uh, so there we go. Uh, anybody else? Uh, last call. Uh, Want to tell us your resolution, uh, Alfred? I, I made a resolution many, 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 many years ago, and I've never broken it. And that was to never make a New Year's resolution. And so that just saves me heartache from things that don't come to pass. And and never make a resolution and keep it absolutely. Great, great. Yes, Perfect. All right. Well, it is a, uh, a special night for us. We are so happy and excited to have uh, Mike Mandel here as our guests. So I'm going to tell you officially, the official part is Mike Mandel has been a professional hypnotist since 1975. He's traveled the world doing thousands of hypnosis shows. He's a forensic hypnotist who works with the police on major crimes. Uh, you work with the police on major, never mind. I'm, I'll, I'll be careful <laughs> about that. And these days he loves teaching hypnosis in uh, in the Toronto, their Toronto classroom, conferences around the world, and especially online at the Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy. I got to tell you though, I mean that's the official thing. The unofficial thing <laughs> is the first time that I saw Mike Mandel was in fact at Hypno Thoughts Live, uh, probably nine years ago or or eight, you know quite quite a long time ago, and um, and I saw him with an an ocean of red Mike Mandel T-shirted uh, associates. Oh my God! He came in. He came in stronger than the uh, than the Hare Krishnas when I used to live in Hayden Ashbury. Uh, <laughs> hit the corner. So uh, so anyway, it, it was it was beautiful, and I and I just really remember what a lovely thing because for me the most important thing about all of this and the way that we work, uh, the way that we learn from each other is about community. And before I even knew you, what I saw was that about uh, about you, Mike. So. Uh, I really appreciate it. I've gotten to know you, uh, you know, a little bit through time and some conversations and uh, what a lovely human being you are. So we're, uh, we're thrilled to have you with us, Michael. And uh, uh, so welcome. Thank you so much. My friends, I call my friends, all of us need each other in this industry. There's more work than we can all possibly do. We can never stop learning. And it is a blessing for me to be here today. I've been looking forward to this. And let me tell you the format I plan to do. Michael, I understand that you wrap things up at 5-2. So that's uh, my atomic clock says that's about uh, some time from now. <laughs> I can't do that kind of math in my head. But uh, here, here's my outcome for you. I've, I've made some really interesting discoveries in working with ego states that I've being blessed to share with Gordon Emerson. Dr. Emerson's the foremost authority on ego states without a doubt. We've got him coming to speak to our group online in a couple of months, which was wonderful to be able to secure him. And I've sent him my protocols. And what I would like to do is tell you my experience with ego states, why they are an absolute game changer for all of you and me. And I'm gonna tell you about two protocols I came up with then. Any questions you have, I'll answer them the best I can. And then what I'll do is I will put in the chat um, a link 
and will give you my protocol as a document, two different ones in one document, the two that I'll teach tonight. So you can use it with your clients and use it with yourself. And I would love to hear the spectacular results that you get in transforming your own life as well as the lives of your clients. Because seriously, guys, isn't that what it's all about? You know, changing, changing the world one person at a time. When we when we see someone else transformed before our eyes, whether we're Ericksonians or Almanians or timeline practitioners, whatever, we it's the biggest kick of all to see somebody manifest transformation and health and wellness. And so that's what this is all about. I show you some new ways of doing that. And I know they're new ways because if Gordon Emerson didn't know about them, they certainly didn't exist before. I've been blessed to have an interesting upbringing. I was born in England and we came to Canada in um, 1957. So I'm, I've been a Canadian since 1967. Started doing hypnosis as a hobby in 1965 and began doing it full time in exactly 19 days. It'll be 48 years of hypnosis being my, my sole source of income and my life and my, my passion, my fascination. But this is going to go down so much better if we all get in the zone for the rest of the story. And here's how we're going to do it. I came up with this protocol a few years back. I gave it to Igor Letohovsky and he just freaking loved it. I stumbled on it. I didn't invent it. This is Chinese medicine. There's a pressure point on the back of the hand that in EFT they call the nine gamut, but it's really the triple warmer. If you look at either hand between your little finger and your ring finger, that channel, two fingertips wide, that in Chinese medicine, that's the spot for removing resistance to change, which is really interesting. And we're gonna add an anchor to this. And I agree um, completely with you, Karen, about hypnosis being BS and NLP being BS. I love what my dear friend, Melissa Tears said. She said, somebody made all this shit up. <laughs> but the bottom line is what kind of results are we getting with it? And that, that's the test of any model is it's usefulness according to John Grinder anyway. I agree with him. So this spot is where we're gonna tap. And then you're gonna press your thumb tip to the fingertip of your ring finger. I, I suggest use your non-dominant hand because you're not gonna do it accidentally very often. You're gonna press it, you're gonna look at it intently and you're gonna say, awesome. That way you're anchoring in three systems. You're kinesthetically anchoring it, you can feel it. You're visually anchoring it because you can see it and you're hearing yourself say, awesome. So you're hitting all three systems. We're gonna load this up. So start tapping here. I want you to say this, make sure your mic is off, but say this as though you mean it, even if you don't believe in it at all, make sure you're between the little finger and the ring finger in that channel right there. Perfect. So say this like you mean it. I am in the zone. I am a learning machine. I am awesome. I do hypnosis flawlessly. I am the God hypnosis in human form. And I haven't just joined a cult. And then hit your awesome anchor. Awesome. Look at it. Let it sit. Woo. Excellent. You should feel that running up and down your spine now. Now, what we've done is we've called a part your most resourceful ego state to the executive. That's what this does. Uh, is it powerful? I showed some of you the picture of my final show at Western University. I performed at Western University for 42 years every year, Frosh Week. The kids who saw me when they were 18 are much older than that now. But for a guy, who's almost 70, I'll be 70 in three months, to get on stage in front of 6,500 teenagers and hold their attention, I gotta be in the zone. And this is the method I would use in my dressing room. I'd hit the stage like ACDC. Speaking of which, yes, ACDC, you heard me. So that gets you in the zone. And what we're gonna look at, and the reason I said um, I'm the God hypnosis in human form is that's been a standing joke since I got a flat tire in my car a number of years ago. I asked Siri, I said, Siri, I got a flat tire. Oh, she's answering. I guess we're going to watch it. And she said, oh, you're lucky, Dr. Doom. She's called me Dr. Doom. This entire place, 600 meters from here. Shall I take you there? Yes. So I drive my car limping along. I pull up to the front. And this 17-year-old kid with straggly hair comes out the door. And he's got a Slipknot t-shirt on, really weird and violent looking. And I said, hey, Slipknot. He said, yeah, it's a band. I said, I know. I like the first album best, the one just called Slipknot. He said, do you know Slipknot? And I said, yeah. He said, I don't listen to them too much anymore. They make me violent. I said, that's why I stopped listening to them too. He said, well, your license plate in your car says hypnosis. Are you a hypnotist? I said, no, I'm the God hypnosis in human form here to help the world. Kid goes, cool. <laughs> so I've been saying it ever since. And you're welcome to use it too. So ego states. Ego states are parts in NLP terms, subpersonalities, the, the 
digital parts of who we are. And if you track it back, it goes back to Paul Federn, who was a compatriot of Freud. Paul Federn taught it to Watkins and Watkins, American psychologist, husband and wife. And from them, Gordon Emerson got hold of it. Who's an American psychologist living in the US, uh, living in Australia now. Emerson did the most work on it, but he's the one who put out the thought that our personalities are digital. And these are not psychological constructs. Dr. Emerson is very careful to explain these are burned in neural pathways in our brains. They're not there because we want them to be there. I think they're there. they are burned into our brains with protein kinase C, they actually exist. So when you point at yourself, you're actually pointing at an ego state. You're pointing at the ego state that is executive at that moment. Don't to be executive means that electro, electrically, bioelectrically, that particular bundle of neural pathways, that is that part of you, is at that moment connected to your prefrontal cortex. So it is running the show. Now there's two models for this I find interesting. I'll give you the first one, then I'll give you the better one. The first one is the idea of a classroom. You have a classroom, maybe 35, 40 kids, however many there are they're jamming in now, and the teacher is absent from the room. And the teacher's chair and desk are at the front. And in that classroom, there are kids who break into different cliques. There's kids who hang around together all the time. There's one standing in the corner who hasn't spoken in years. There's some who hate each other. There's some who love each other. There's some who are quiet and just want to read. There's others who are boisterous and interested in sports. Whichever child sits down in that teacher's chair and runs the class is the ego state that's executive at that moment. Now, a better model is this. Imagine a bungalow, one-story house, but like a Canadian house here in Toronto, we have basements. I know in Australia, there aren't many of those in some parts of the U.S. as well. But a basement's where people have their recreation room, their media room, their TV, their couch, you know, they're off in their fireplaces. We do. And this bungalow has only one door, posit the existence of a single door to the outside world. And on the top floor, you have the five to 15 ego states that deal with the world on a regular basis. They're the ones mostly executive. Below in the basement, you have the other 100, 150 that don't come up very often, but when needed, they'll come up to the main floor. Now, whichever ego state is answering the front door, dealing with the world, that's the one that's executive. But again, only one can fit in that doorway at any given time. The others can try to push in, and if they're strong enough, they'll push it out and they'll take the executive. They'll be looking at the world. But down off the basement, you have to think of something like a root cellar, a bomb shelter. And this is where the traumatized ego states are. Those that are evaded, as Gordon Emerson said, evaded means invaded by fear, anger, sadness, trauma. They're the ones that suffer. They're the ones that hold phobias and deep trauma and sexual hurts and all these different things. Now, they don't want to come up to the main floor, let alone answer the door. And we'll get to how to deal with those in just a moment. So I'll give you a protocol you can do on yourself that'll blow your mind. But let's go back into them a bit. So whichever one is dealing with the outside world, that's the one executive. Now you have ego states and so do I that have not been executive for many, many years. In fact, you have an ego state that tells you when you're hungry, that's its job. You have another one that tells you when it's time to go to bed, you suddenly notice you're tired. I have one that plays with Gwaihir, my Egyptian male cat. I'm an allurophile, confirmed cat lover. And when I play with him, I have this very gentle, loving ego state. But I also have an ego, ego state that teaches British Army Jiu-Jitsu. Now, when I'm teaching Jiu-Jitsu to martial artists, I don't want my cat playing ego state executive. I'm going to get the crap kicked out of me. Likewise, when I'm playing with the cat, I don't want to put a rear naked choke on him and take him to the ground. It's the wrong ego state. And we function best as human beings. And integration happens when we have the right ego state executive for the job at hand, because they like doing things. If you can give them a job they like to do, they're real good at it. And when I started to really understand this, it goes back many, many years. My fourth birthday in England, 1957, be just before we moved to Canada. I have an older sister, seven years older than me. And now that I'm coming up to seven and she's 77, that's not much of a difference. But when I was four and she was 11, it was a big difference. But my mom and dad, my dad was British Army, Royal Engineers. My mom, housewife, the four of us were going to a birthday party for me at my Aunt Sheila's house. Now, Sheila was my dad's sister. And we had to, we were living in Manchester, actually Chatterton, part of Manchester. We had to take a Manchester double-decker bus to Sheila's house. Didn't have much money, didn't have a car. 
And I'd never had a birthday party before in my life. And it was very exciting. And we got to Aunt Sheila's house. And I remember to this day, all those years ago, we had a cake. We had a box of black magic chocolates that were an expensive luxury back then. We had tea. Everybody had tea because we were Brits. Someone had given me a box of cardboard cutout soldiers to play with. And someone else gave me a teddy bear. And I'd never had a teddy bear in my life. And I instantly named him Teddy, put him on my knee. I can remember bouncing him on my knee, drinking tea and eating chocolates. And it was the happiest day of my life. And you got to realize back then I spoke like this because I was just a lad from Manchester. And when I was with my family, I spoke like this all the time too. I learned to be Canadian when I was told. If I'd stayed in Manchester, still speaking like this, it would not be horrible. So back to Canada. We go home. It's starting to rain. We get a rush for the bus. Good times have to come to an end. And we get off the bus at the other end, you know, 40 minutes later, whatever, and bundle out of the bus. We get on the top deck. And we get about 100 yards up the street with sweaters and umbrellas and all this stuff. And I realize I left my bear on the bus. And I can remember sobbing and feeling terrified and grief stricken. I remember those feelings clearly. I can't feel them anymore, thank God, because I've healed them. But it was horrible. And my dad called the bus company. They made the usual inquiries, as we say in Britain. The bear was never found. And that childhood wounded, vaded ego state moved out of the executive for many, many years. And I buried all of that pain, barely knew it was there. And from reacting to that pain, I went through some really crap times in my life. I was not a very nice person at all. And then many, many years later, my wife, we've been married 41 years. I, I still call her my first wife just to keep her on her toes. She's as sharp as a tack. I mean, she's just the smartest person I know. She's just wonderful. And she knows all my stories and all the stupid things I've done and gone through and loves me anyway. And one Christmas, you know that story, the Chris, a Christmas story with Ralphie and he gets the Red Ryder gun, BB gun. That was filmed a five minute walk from my house here in Toronto. All the indoor shots in Indiana were all shot in Magda Studios up the road from me. All the shots in the house were indoors in the studio. And the Chinese restaurant they go to the end is a French restaurant in Toronto. Now we went to it New Year's Eve a couple of years ago and they've got the leg lamp there still. So it's kind of cool. But if you remember the story, Ralphie finds his final present his dad gives him this BB gun he didn't know he was getting. So Christmas is my wife's birthday, Christmas day. So it's a big deal in our house. It's really funny because Mandel is a Jewish name. And I'm an Anglo-Irish-Scottish Presbyterian, so I don't know how the hell that happened. So Christmas is a big deal in our house. And um, Christmas morning, my wife opens her presents and her birthday presents. And I open my presents. And we're starting to put everything away. And she says to me, I think there's another present there. Present there. And what? What? Like, we come like a little kid. She said, I'll be behind that furniture. And I look. And there is. There's a package. I pull it out. It says to Mike from Santa Claus, to rip the paper off. And it was a teddy bear. And the instant I hugged that bear, that childhood ego state that was Vaded, that had not been executive for over 30 years, suddenly became executive. And I screamed with pain. I ab reacted uncontrollably, hugging this bear, sobbing, tears running down my face. My wife didn't know what was happening, but she was smart enough to just let me do it. And in that moment, my friends, I healed. And that childhood ego, ego state let go of all the trauma and all the pain. And the healing was found in that bear. And when I tell this story, I tell you the truth. That bear sleeps in my bed every single night to this day since 1986. And when I go to bed at night, my wife on the other side of the bed with her bed, Bunchy Bear, I hug my bear. His name's Teddy. It's on his shirt. Same bear. I hug that bear. And that childhood ego state becomes executive and safe. And the world is a safe, magical, beautiful place. And I'm telling you, my friends, thank God that changed me. And I started to look into ego states shortly after that. And the interesting thing is, as you make adjustments with them, as you deal with them in different ways, you can make phenomenal shifts below the threshold of your conscious awareness. So tonight, what I'm going to teach you at the end of all this presentation is two ways of dealing with it. How to do self-work with your own ego states. 
below the threshold of your conscious awareness and be prepared to feel a bit odd for a couple of days while it's happening. And the other one, how to make phenomenal shifts in your ego state by actually changing its appearance. And by doing that, you change the metaphor, the whole thing changes. Let's move on to the next one here. I said there's Vedic ego states that are traumatized. And I said there's healthy ego states. And most of yours and mine will be healthy. And they will know about other ego states depending on the neural pathways that are connecting them. Those are the ones that hang out together. They've got clear neural pathways. And we as workers of change and hopefully healthy human beings, we become more loving, more helpful, more compassionate as we become integrated. And please don't think for one minute I'm saying I'm there. I'm not. I don't think it ever stops this side of eternity. But I'm better than I was last year. And I think I'm better than I was last month. <laughs> but we can't normally tell. Other people can tell when we're changing. But the more ego states we can heal in our own brains and the more of them that can build solid protein kinase C neural pathways between them so they know about each other, they value each other, the more integrated we become. And that's the difference between us and people who are dissociative identity disorder, formerly multiple personality. They have all the ego states too, but just some of them don't really know about each other very well. They're, they're not that connected. And these are unfortunately the experiments with the uh, MK Ultra program that George Estabrook out of Edmonton, Alberta and MT Orna, University of Pennsylvania in 1959. They worked with these horrific experiments in Canada and in the US, uh, McGill University of Montreal with Ewan Cameron, attempting to fragment people's personalities through insulin shock electroshock, un, you know, undetected doses of LSD, hundreds of them, keeping people isolated. They used human beings in modern Western society to experiment to see if they could create alters, if they could create ego states that were splintered from the personality. The reason why was George Esther Brooks wanted to create a courier or a Manchurian candidate who could commit a murder, not remember it themselves, because the Vedic ego state would carry it back into the unconscious. It was horrific work. I mean, just reprehensible and much of it has come up recent years. But that's the difference. If you're really traumatized like that, you have multiple personalities, you're, you're a normal person whose ego states just don't connect with each other and some of them need healing. Well, there's also dissonant ego states. And dissonant states are those who, they don't wanna be executive sometimes, but they wind up there. And the, when the wrong ego state is executive, everything goes off the rails. I saw a Canadian canoeist, Adam Vancouverton, in the Beijing Olympics, watched him on TV. I met this guy. He did one man canoe. This guy was so freaking fast, you could practically water ski behind him. And I thought, this guy's supposed to win the goal. Everybody said he was the fastest in the world. I watched him race, something fell apart. And afterwards, they said to him, Adam, like, what happened? Your game's near. He said, such telling words. I don't know, I, I just felt like I didn't show up today. Yeah, didn't show up. His commanding, competitive, athletic ego state that can win was not the one that was executive. Now that's why I teach you this, this tapping. When you make these positive, powerful statements, I'm in the zone, I'm the God hypnos in human form, I'm a compassionate, caring human being, always stated in the positive, and then fire that anchor. You are stacking them on that anchor and then keep your, your resource anchor fully charged. If you're watching a comic who makes you laugh your ass off, notice you're laughing, that you're having a blast, fire your awesome anchor again, add it to the charge. If you're out with some friends in the woods and you notice how beautiful a day is, add it again, keep stacking them. So when you have a problem, you can fire your awesome anchor and in seconds be in a better state. That's an aside. So a dissonant ego state doesn't wanna be executive. Adam Vancouver, and that was the case. We had a guy in my class in Toronto, wonderful young man, an amazing trainer from England, from Yorkshire, England, lives in Toronto now, great guy. And he came up for a demonstration. And here's his problem. This guy was an amazing trainer, could hold the room in his hand. Everybody thought he was brilliant, and he was. But sometimes, as he explained it, he'd get up on the platform, even if it was a really professional, a supportive group of people who knew him, sometimes, He'd be nervous, have anxiety attacks, would stumble over his words, and he'd do a crap job. And he said, I don't know what does it. Put him in a trance. Now, to get to our superficial ego states, we can access them without hypnosis. But you need hypnosis to get to the ones down in the dirty stuff down in the basement, and especially the ones down in the, uh, the bomb shelter. 
So I asked his ego state that likes to present, that's great at presenting. They gave all the conditions that loves presenting in front of an audience and is powerful to come to the surface and let me know when he's here. Now, that's pretty typical stuff with parts and things. There's nothing new in this. And he sat for about 45 seconds and waited. And then suddenly this deep resonant voice came out of this guy. And he said, I am here. He's like, wow. <laughs> now this man's name is Richard. He didn't, wouldn't mind me telling you this. In fact, we recorded the whole thing. And I said, what can I call you? Their name will always be their nature. And it said, Lionheart. Wow, Richard the Lionheart was Britain's king who went and fought overseas. And interesting, here's a Brit and the, his ego stays a Lionheart. What do you do? I make him do great presentations and wow, okay, fine. Now, Lionheart, can I just ask you to step aside for a minute? If you keep using their name, name they stay executive. I'd like to speak to the other part of you, the other ego state, the one that hates being up in front of the group and sometimes winds up there. And I watch his entire demeanor change. And it says, I'm here. And I said, what is your name or nature? It said plant. And after a bit of interrogation, it determined it was a little growing delicate plant. And he felt like he was gonna get stepped on. I said, why are you there? He said, I don't know. I said, do you wanna not be there? He said, yes. <laughs> so we get Lionheart to agree to take the executive whenever he has a presentation and plant can stay in the background and be safe and just watch. They shake hands to seal the deal, bang, problem's gone. Now, classic case of dissonance, an ego state that does not wanna be executive at that time. You want the right one for the job. And when you learn how to contact them, you can negotiate with them the most amazing stuff. Listen to this one. I sat down one day, put myself in a trance, and I asked for my most powerful, fearless, resourceful ego state to become executive. And then I gave it the name 008. <laughs> so it's like 007 plus one. And in trance, I had it in front of me and said, all I would like you to do, I know this things you're great at. It's gotta be something they wanna do. Are you willing that in the event of any life-threatening emergency, you will take the executive absolutely flawlessly and maintain the executive until the emergency is over? And it was, oh, yeah, definitely, no problem with that. Okay, that was the agreement. I forget about it. Five or six months passes. My wife and I are driving on Highway 401 in Toronto. Highway 401, it's always funny because our students come from around the world, as far as Singapore and everything, Japan, and they figure Toronto's gonna be a backwater. They don't know it's the third biggest city in North America after New York and LA. And Highway 401 across the top of the city is 16 lanes wide, like it's a big mother. So we're flying along 401 at highway speed, maybe 70 miles an hour. It's a pickup truck in the lane ahead of me, maybe 75 feet ahead. It's got a dresser on the back. All of a sudden, the back ramp thing isn't fastened properly. It falls down. The guy hits a bump and the entire dresser falls off the back of this truck in front of my car at 70 miles an hour with cars all around me. And guess what happened? Ba -da -bum, ba -da -bum. Dun -dun 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 -dun. 008 takes the executive bang check the blind spot around this thing back in the lane i put my hand on my carotid artery my heart rate was not elevated my wife said who always criticizes my driving she said wow that was some fancy driving i said mandel mike mandel i mean it was a blast but the the thing is it actually worked there was an ego state that was watching just for its time to save the day I recommend you do the same thing. And out of that came the different protocols that I developed. So the first one was something, and I'll give you both of these. The first one was something to you can do with a client or you can do on yourself. The idea being, since you need a trance, you have to get to a very specific ego state. So you need a pretty deep trance to do this. But if you're adept at self-hypnosis, you can certainly manage it and you can run it with idiomotor signals. You'll, you'll get the response you want. One of the ego states that we have, all of us, is a very interesting one. And I think Emerson calls it highest wisdom. It is the only ego state we have that all the others respect and will obey no matter what. It's got such authority. It can be either gender and it will be stentorian in how it speaks. It's powerful. I worked with a therapist who had some horrendous problems and I contacted her highest ego state, this highest wisdom. And when that thing spoke, you'd think the goddess Athena had walked into the room. It was just mind blowing. So you got one, so do I. And you contact your highest wisdom state and you negotiate with it. And the way you do this is you make, you state the obvious. You say, you're doing a great job. You protected me all these years and the evidence is I'm still here. 
Uh, you made me well when I've been sick. Sometimes you brought the right health giving states in. You've helped me sleep at night. You've been the overlord to all these other things. And I want to honor and thank you. Now, you can't bully them. You can build great friendships with them if you're sincere, because they can tell. Oh, by the way, while I'm telling you this, all your ego states are listening, <laughs> which is something to keep in mind. They know what they know all about this. So you won't have to educate. But they're listening just like your, your current executive one is as well. So you make contact with highest wisdom and you say, here's a task I would love for you to do if you will take it on. Find ego states that are extremely healthy, extremely functional, very resourceful, and form a committee with them below the threshold of my conscious awareness. When they've done that, send them out to find wounded, traumatized, disconnected ego states that need help and nurture them, help them heal, bring them back into the group, and then they become part of the committee as well. And what happens is you have an ever-growing committee of neural pathways that are building more neural pathways, and it's estimated at the rate of 1 million per second on average. That's how fast your brain is creating new connections. And what happens is they bring the others into the fold, and highest wisdom can be the, the go-to if there's any problems. You get them to agree with this, and then you come out of trance, and that's it. You only have to do it once. And my friends, what happens is over the days, weeks, months, you start to change. You start to feel better. Your mind becomes clearer. You'll have fewer anxieties. You'll be happy more often, and you will build in a deeper compassion for other people than you've ever had in your life. Because I'm a real believer that if we are moving regardless of our spiritual beliefs, religious beliefs, ethical beliefs, if we are moving from a place, a place of genuinely, honestly loving and caring about that person in front of us, something remarkable happens. And the more clean a vessel we are, the more integration that's happened, the easier it is to build that bridge. Well, people who have done this have reported that for a couple of days, they feel pretty weird. As my mentor, the late Derek Bomber, would say, they're changing a lot of foretuples. Below the surface of their awareness, they're shifting. Visual, auditory, kinesthetic ways of storing things and making all kinds of auditory digital shifts and assigning new names to things and new natures to things. And the results can be remarkable. One of the most astounding things with this is how quickly it can work. And so I'll make sure that I put this, Michael, if, if I forget, since I am a senior citizen, <laughs> if I forget to put this, before we click off in the chat, I'm not gonna put it in now because I don't know anybody looking at it yet. Um, remind me, and I've, I've got the page and I've got it ready to, uh, what I did to make it easier for you is I consolidated both protocols in one document. Um, if you use it, use it my blessings. Um, but if anyone asks you where you got it, please say that you got it from me. The other thing is this, the second protocol. So that's ego state integration protocol, mm -hmm. wonderful self work. The second one is actually even more startling. This comes from something that happened to me a few years back. This is one of Freddie Jacklin's favorite stories I tell. He just finds this hilarious. A number of years ago, maybe three years ago, I had this thing kept happening to me. It wasn't happening to me. It was something I was doing, actually. So it would always happen with my wife. If, if any of you, if you're aware of the Enneagram, Enneagram uh, personality typing system, just wait so I can see how many of you know. You don't know what the Enneagram, if you do know what it is, okay, great. Um, I'm a classic Enneagram 8. I'm a martial artist, you know, teach edged weapons, taught hand-to-hand -hand combat to police and military. I'm an 8. I'm a good 8. We're the white knights. We want to protect the infirm, the weak, the children, the dogs, you know, the pu pu puppies and pussy cats and everything. When Enneagram 8s are good, they're real good. But when they're bad, they're real bad. My, white, my wife is an Enneagram 6. The 6s are full of anxiety. She's smart, smart, knows she's anxious, knows it's ridiculous. So she wants to be protected. I want to protect. So it's a very good symbiotic relationship. But I was screwing it up. Sometimes in casual conversation, I just mentioned some offhand thing that to me was unimportant and it would frighten her. Like I'd see a car on the street a few times. I said, well, that car's been out there three days in a row now. Right away, Enneagram 6 anxiety. What are they doing? Who's out there? What's going on? I go, oh, shoot, I've done it again. I frightened her. And I want to fright, don't want to frighten anybody. It's not nice to be scared. I want people to be happy, not scared. And so I go, I've done it again. I've just mentioned something offhand. And oh, oh yeah, I just got this thing. And they said that this had happened with the account. What? Do you think we're losing money? Is there a problem with the business? I don't know. No, 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 not at all. And I thought, this is a damned ego state problem. 
I put myself in a trance and I asked the ego state that keeps saying these things and scaring Heather. I said, I know you're doing it for a good purpose. So you got to honor them. You realize the intention's good. I said, I'd like you to appear in front of me. I'm in a trance, eyes closed. I, can, I do deep trance real well. I cut a cyst out of my own genitals. So I know about trance. <laughs> so I nearly cut one out of my arm, but it's too close to an artery, so I can't. But I was going to do it in video. Anyway, all that to say, I go into a deep trance, and this thing appears in front of me. This guy, he, had, he was unshaven. He had a huge mouth. It was just a head, huge mouth, tiny little ears, tiny top of his head, and just big, big mouth. And I said, what is your name? And he said, Blurter. I said, what, is you, what do you do for me? He said, I say things I find are interesting. I just blurt them out. And I thought, okay, there it is. So I started talking to him, said, are you willing to take a different role and maybe try something else? That, I know you're doing a great job, but this should be even better at it. He said, I guess so. I said, but first, what if we change your appearance and make you look even more awesome? He goes, well, that would be good. I said, what if we shrink your mouth down so you have less urge to blurt things out? He went, Okay. And I said, what if we make the top of your head way bigger, a larger brain pan, so you're much, much smarter? Yeah, I want to do that. Okay. And what about if, and this is going to happen over time, or you can change it immediately. What if we make your ears bigger? So you listen more and listen for cues and notice cues. He agreed to all this. And I said, and you continue these changes as time goes on. God is my witness. True story. About a week later, I checked in with him. He was wearing what looked like his full personnel in an Armani suit. This great looking guy looked like he was on the cover of GQ. He was unshaven, but now it was that cool sort of unshaven look that I can't do because I got white whiskers. And this guy was looking great. And I said, do you need anything else? He said, I need equipment. See, he's got a laptop. He's got a USB cable that comes from the laptop, plugs directly into his brain. And here's his task. Every time I was about to say something. He came up with this system. He'd flash yellow across a band across my vision in my mind. Careful of that. And I go, oh, okay, wouldn't say it. If he flashed orange, it was definitely don't say that. And if it was red, it was like, what the hell do you think you're doing, Mike? We built in this color-coded system and I stopped annoying my wife. But he was doing such a great job. I had an ego state that was loving it. I said, do you want a better task? Sure. Why don't I put you in control of more stuff? That's years ago now, two years ago. Now his name is Master Controller. It was Controller for a while. Now it's Master Controller. He's got like 18 other ego states working with him. And when I check in with him, and now I can do it in an instant, he's sitting at this desk, the screen's everywhere. And all I have to do is say something like, oh, I've noticed that my driving's getting really sloppy lately. I'm not concentrating. He says, okay, I'll put a man on it. And he's on his computer. And in two days, my driving's improved. And I have not consciously done anything different. It's crazy, I know. When I explain this to Gordon Emerson, he said it made sense that when you change the appearance of the ego state, you're metaphorically changing its nature as well. There's a whole other aspect of this, though. It's something called interjects. Now, we can have ego states that are out of alignment with each other, that are clashing. And that's where the first protocol can really help. It can help them negotiate and agree to get along and do tasks that don't drive each other crazy. You've got to chunk up in NLP terms for that. But then there's interjects, and interjects are not ego states, but they look like them, and they feel like them, and they act like them. Ego states are constructs, and the difference is interjects, you can kick them out if they're a problem. And here's a weird thing happened to me involving interjects. And an interject can be a car crash. You know, we had a friend, um, she and her husband and their little boy were in a car crash. And it's all she talked about for two years. See her two years later. Hey, how are you? Oh, we had a car crash. It was in front of her eyes all the time. It's this interject presenting this. Well, when I was about 12, 13 years old, I was given a pellet gun for my birthday. 177 caliber German made Jacato pellet gun. And as most little boys do at that time, I started shooting birds. And which was very odd because I'm an animal person. I love animals. And I shot a couple of crows outside our, our apartment building from the window. And over the years, that started to torment me. I mean, literally torment me. I felt guilt over it. Um, I would well up with deep sadness and just something really got to me about it. So one day I put myself in a trance in the living room, Heather had gone out. I said, I'm gonna deal with this. I put a chair opposite me facing me. 
and I asked the interject of the crows to appear in that chair, and they did. And I talked to them, and I said, I was just a little boy. I was just trying to feel powerful and strong. And you know what the bird said to me? It said, we just wanted to be your friend. We wanted to be friends with you, and you killed us. And I broke down crying, broke down. The pain from that was almost more than I could take. And again, all the trauma left. And then I talked to the interject. I didn't kick them out. I said, you know what? I said, will you forgive me? And the interject says, we forgive you. And I said, I promise I will never hurt an animal or bird again. And I will protect them. And I'll especially protect crows and ravens, which I have a real love for. In fact, even the, even the coaster in front of me here is a crow. And everything changed from that moment. I didn't want the interject to leave because it caused no problems, but it unmasked a deep trauma, a pain I was carrying from being a little boy that I didn't know was there. It's like regressing yourself in a way, which brings to an, a really important point. How many of you do, do either EFT or thought field therapy or top of socket pressure technique or be set for fast or fast or EFT or any one of these tapping things? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, me too. Uh, I studied with Willem Lammers years ago, Swiss psychologist, did a bunch of those, loved it, got amazing results. I was the person he demoed on in front of the class and it just couldn't believe how well it worked. Went on to study EFT and then faster EFT. And now I use my own six step, which adds one point to faster EFT. It makes it work a bit better by dealing with Chinese medicine anxiety point too. All that to say, there's times when I thought I did everything right, but it didn't work. Now, those of you who do this know that when you clear a trauma or something, with I cleared hundreds of things flawlessly with this, sometimes it didn't work. Even though the person was saying a good reminder phrase or um, they were hydrated, that was one of the problems. If you're not hydrated, sometimes it won't work. I give them a bottle of water, then it would work. Sometimes no. Sometimes there's an electromagnetic disturbance where you are and it doesn't work. Move into another room, it works. Had that, it amazed me. My wife's best friend had to identify her nephew's body. He died of a heroin overdose. And she told the story, she was in agony. We're doing the tap and the suds were at 10 and we're doing the tapping, do a round, it goes down to nine and a half. And then another round is down to eight and a half, just agonizing. Couldn't get it to go faster, give her water notes. We moved into the sunroom at the back of my house, 15 feet away and it's dropping nine, two, gone. Super drops like it's supposed to. And she's shining and she's feeling better. We're taking the layers off. I found out what it was. And this is why I say that ego states, knowing about them is a game changer. Now it always works. The reason why is in the original EFT, if you did that Gary Craig stuff, you'll remember you did the tapping on the hand and you know people were doing um, applied kinesiology then where there's a lot of muscle testing and they were thinking about brain balancing. So we had our eyes spinning, we we're humming happy birthday and you know all these different things. When I studied with Larry Nims, he said, I haven't done that in years, pretend you don't need it. And I went, okay, he's a report back, never needed it again. Just <laughs> okay, it works without it. So I threw it out, always trying to simplify, 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 but sometimes it didn't work. And what made it really interesting was the times it did work was when the person could feel in their body what the pain was. So think about it. When they feel it in their body, the traumatized ego state is executive and it has to be executive to get rid of the problem. This is a classic thing hypnotists have run into all the time. They have, um, they have a smoking cessation client. The person's on the phone. I got to quit. I got to quit. Can I see you today? No, I can't possibly fit you until two. Please, I'm going to quit. I've had it with this. It's going to destroy my life. They show up two days later. So you're the guy who really wants to quit. And they go like this. Mm -hmm. I think I do. Who's going to talk? You got it? <laughs> Okay, so, you know, they're not into it now. They're, yeah, I should quit. I should quit. What's happened is the ego state that made the appointment is not the one that showed up in the office. You have to have the state executive and the way to get it executive and to keep it there is have them feel it in their body now. And the mistake is in our language in a lot of the time. What did it feel like when you saw that snake on the golf course? Oh, it felt bad. Oh, how bad was it? Oh, it was a nine out of 10. Okay, top news. What is it now? Uh, it's still a nine. Oh, it's an eight. No, no, no. Feel it now. That snake's here now. How bad can you make it feel right now? Oh, it's a seven right now. Can you push it higher? Yeah, I can push it to an eight. Okay, now do the tapping. Then it goes away real fast. It's the same when you do the NLP rewind technique. 
They have to feel it in their body to activate the traumatized ego state. Guys, this is such a, a game changer. You'll see it. You'll see people change states right in front of your eyes. They look different from each other. They talk differently. They have different mannerisms. And you have to be aware of that. And that's where calibration, A, B, C, always be calibrating is one of our greatest tools. When we're calibrating our clients, we can see those ego states shift. And anytime you need a great ego state, do the tapping <laughs> right here, removing blocks to transformation and change and state everything in the positive. I'm in the zone. I feel awesome. All my resources are online. I'm a learning machine. I'm great at this stuff. Stay it, say it positive, present, stay, present tense, fire your awesome anchor again. And if you change the appearance of an ego state, you'll change everything about it. If you have rapport with that ego state and honor it, and it's a job it wants to do, everything changes and it will stay changed as well. Going after it directly is sometimes the key. When I worked with a woman who had the um, highest wisdom state, it sounded like the goddess Athena that erupted and was amazing. She had an 18 month old ego state, preverbal. And it seems now that even when we cannot understand language as a child. If we're looking at Noam Chomsky's matrix for language acquisition, it seems that when we develop language during times of sleep, when we're having REM states, one of the things the brain does is go back over the memories that were just sounds and update them with words now. That makes sense. So even the memories, the language can be recovered. It's startling. David Cheek, I think, did some work on this. Dabney Ewan did work on it. It's phenomenal stuff. But the thing is, if you're very specific and get the ego state that has the problem executive, you'll make phenomenal changes quickly. And with this woman who had the 18 month old preverbal baby executive, it was left in a crib in Germany, uncovered with the window open on a very cold night. And her aunt and uncle in the other room didn't notice. And she shivered and cried all night, which she did in, in her office. It was actually her office I met her in. So here's how we healed her. I asked for an ego state, a strong nurturing ego state that would protect her and keep her warm and give her all the help she needed to become executive. And this one did and agreed to look after her. And when the woman came out of hypnosis at the end, the way she described it to me was this, the ego state that helped me, she said it was a big burly Scottish woman. And she said, she wrapped me in a blanket, said, I've got you lost, you're all right with me. And she said she felt completely safe and the problems disappeared instantly. So we'll open the questions in a sec. Let's just say though, uh, summary. I used to say when I was started doing therapy in 93, I used to say, you know, most things we can get to with a different variety of tools. Then I started saying, wow, it seems like a lot of things have parts or I didn't even know their ego states then underlying them. Then I started saying maybe 15 years ago, it seems like most things are ego state problems, but I don't say that anymore. Now I say they're always ego state problems because they really are in some way or another, either a state that wants to learn and can't, or one that's traumatized that needs to release the trauma. There will always be an executive ego state that you have to deal with. The key is make sure you're dealing with the one that has the freaking problem. And if you do that and clear everything and check your work, check your work, check your work, always future pace, always set up idiomotor signals, whatever, make sure the work is very, very thorough. And then you won't have any surprises. The world will be the pathway to your door because you'll be doing stellar work. So I'm gonna put these protocols in the chat now, Michael, and I'm gonna hand this back to you if you wanna run any questions for our remaining time. Oh, you're not mic'd. Oh, here we go. Michael, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, lots <laughs> of lovely stuff indeed. By the way, I, I'm reminded, uh, Mike, as you were talking about this, uh, about uh, Jean, uh, Eugene Gendlin, uh, who uh, uh, some of you might recall wrote a book called Focusing, just about the same time that oh, yeah, yeah. and we were doing yep. six and reframing. Uh, and uh, there were some similarities, which was which made it interesting. But Gendlin, as a part of his uh, graduate uh, uh, graduate work, uh, had written a paper on uh, uh, basically trying to describe who who were more likely to be successful uh, successful in psychotherapy than than not. And uh, and his final conclusion was 
uh, the people that were able to uh, to access a felt sense of the experience that they were talking about. So when you were talking about uh, the the ego states uh, that are uh, executive, uh, it seemed to it seemed really to to kind of remind me of that uh, of that other piece of teaching as well. So uh, so everybody, uh, Michael, this is just this is just lovely, fascinating stuff. I, I'm wondering, does uh, anybody have any questions for uh, for Mike? Uh, Wesley, you've got your hand up right away. So let's uh, let's hear from you. <laughs> Mike, this is fascinating. Thank you so very much. The question is, Pleasure. when you negotiate with the executive ego state, who are you? Are you another executive ego state? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's my it's my therapist ego state. <laughs> That's just the negotiating, which is is, is which is very accepting. Um, non-judgmental, but always looking for the truth and, and always building the strongest rapport I can. And, and, and I use John Grinder's ultimate rapport se secret before I work with ego states, you know, the matching and mirroring and all of those wonderful things do a great job, We've all done them. But when he said, just pretend that the person in front of you is the most fascinating, important human being you've ever met in your life, and then pretend you're not pretending anymore and continue to maintain that pretense to the end of the session and when we do that the mirror neurons in our brains take over and it works perfectly thank you so much my pleasure all right uh, anybody else questions questions for mike mandel yeah i have a question please go ahead so, so mike that thank you that, that was amazing i uh, just understand so healthy ego states they're healthy ego states they're Dissident, dissonant ego states and their superficial ego states, or is that how they're- Healthy, healthy, vaded, which are invaded by fear, anger, anger, sadness, and trauma. There's dissonant, the ones who are executive when they don't want to be there. There's conflicted ego states that have issues with other ego states. They have to be negotiated. You have to chunk up, negotiate to get them to get along. And then you seal that by having them shake hands or hug each other, whatever. And it, it does the same thing. And then there's also there's also retro ego states. There's two kinds. I'll tell you really quickly. Retro avoidance states. Every time I've dealt with addiction, it has turned out to be an ego state problem. And here's how it works. A retro avoidance state is an ego state that does stuff like tons of dope, drinks too much, watches excess TV, binges on porn, whatever it is, it, it hogs the executive so that a vaded ego state can't come in and feel the pain. So dealing with the addiction, I don't worry about the one that's doing the process. I want to get to the vaded one that's trying not to go executive. And you can see it happen. You know, if somebody has... Um, an addiction to, you know, say something that's not physical, or say an addiction to television, or, you know, even checking their iPhone. If you hide their iPhone, just watch the anxiety start rising. Because what happens is the Vedic ego state is starting to become executive and it's trying to stay out. And that's the one you got to deal with. So that's a retro avoidance state. There's also a retro original state, a retro original state. According to Emerson, is an ego state that runs a pattern that was very useful in early childhood. And by the way, ego states are not formed because of trauma. That's a myth. They're formed for specific needs, specific tasks, and they get damaged through trauma. But um, a retro original state is an ego state that runs its own little pattern and keeps running it inappropriately. For example, I had a friend and his live-in girlfriend, and it could just easily be, you know, live-in boyfriend makes no difference. It could have been the husband had the problem. It's not that it was because she was a woman. But she used to, when she was a little girl, have temper tantrums and stamp her feet and shake her fists. And the family thought it was hilarious. And when she did that, she got her own way all the time. The problem is it became a retro, original, original retro state. And she would run this in her relationships when she wasn't getting what she wanted. When you're a woman in your late 30s and you stamp your feet and run a tantrum, people don't think it's funny and cute anymore. They think it's psychotic. So that's typically running a childhood pattern that shouldn't be there. And bullying is often that very thing as well. Uh, by the way, uh, Jessica Hansen said she had trouble opening the link, but I think uh, Karen's got it. I clicked through to it. So I know that it's working now. So Jessica. Okay, think, good, good. Yeah, just give it another shot. This is a follow-up on that. So then ego states, are they, I mean, we're born with them or no. they take or like, how do they? They're created in childhood for specific needs. So let's say a child gradually learns to not mess their diapers. They learn to 
let the family know they have to use the washroom, the restroom. That's an ego state developed for that purpose. Ego states tell us we're hungry. Some of them have very menial tasks like that. Others have more complex ones like driving cars. In fact, when your ego state for driving a car, it doesn't even have to be executive. You can be executive with an ego state, you know, having a meeting with somebody on your iPhone while you're driving, but your driving ego state without being executive is running its pattern in the background. And that's how you typically drive really well unconsciously. Driving becomes an unconscious act. And so some of them can function in the background really well, but the only one that is actively dealing with the world will be the one that's executive and it will be traceable back to your childhood. And you have a lot of ego states at different ages. You know, I got a teenage rebellious ego state and it's not a good thing for me to let him become executive. So I don't. So it's, we got to uh, give him an, another task to do. Just make agreements with them. But yeah, they're all formed in childhood. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, and I see another, uh, oh, somebody else just opened up a microphone. Nope. And what's the best way to identify the different ego states? How do you go about doing that? Either um, with run the, the um, yeah, run the protocols that are on the list and that will help you do it. Um, it. It's a very simple way using, it's not as difficult as it might sound. When you get good at dealing with your own ego states you can get in and out of that state very very quickly like i said i've been doing it for three or four well more than that pre-covid maybe five years now so i can check in with master controller really quickly in seconds but you have to build that bridge initially and a simple way is to go into self-hypnosis two chairs it's very gestalt and sit opposite that chair and ask an ego state that would like to deal with you or, or communicate with you to become as though it was sitting in that chair. Now it'll actually be going back and forth in the executive, I imagine, but it will manifest itself in your imagination. And as my dear friend, David Snyder, brilliant trainer says, when the unconscious mind speaks, it speaks softly, it speaks first. You'll think you're making it up. You have a tendency to want to edit what it says, but no, that will be the real unconscious information. And when I saw Blurter, <laughs> changed his name to presenter so he could present ideas to me and then he became controller and then master controller that's through an ongoing relationship with one part of me but each one of them is you you're you're a committee a digital committee and approach it with wonder and curiosity and an element of fun i'm going to show you something here in fact um let me just get this out of the cupboard i wish i was uh i wish i was in the room with you guys so you could see this. I have decks and decks of these because when we teach wizard school, we teach four, four different modalities and one is ego states. And I use these to teach it. These are, sorry, interactive cards, I-N-N-E-R cards. And uh, I got these from Cavisham's bookstore in Toronto, which I think is the world's largest psychological and psychiatric bookstore. But you can get them online, interactive cards, highly recommend them. Because when I teach this, what we do is we get the students, we put on some quiet instrumental music that has no associations with anything. And people sit in the floors at desks, whatever. And they go through this whole deck. Now this is a deck about the size of tarot cards. They're like 50 or 60 different cards that are typical archetypal things. One will be a, a rebel. One might be someone sitting in a library. One might be a little kid playing with a ball outside in the sun. And what we do is you take the cards and you say, do I relate to this card? No. No, whoa, yes, put that one aside. Then you put all the ones you don't relate to back in the, in the box. And then you take all the ones you do relate to and spread them out on the table or on the floor and start getting insights. What would that one be called? When does that one show up? And you'll start to understand because they'll be starting to communicate with you. All oh, these two hang out together all the time. What happens with this one? Why is this one a problem? And you can, Paul Federn used to map them, do Venn diagrams of them overlapping, which know each other, but the cards make it so easy because then, if you have one that's problematic, my method is you set it opposite you in the chair or you hold it in front of you and talk to the card. Now the ego state will get it. You'll know exactly what you're doing. And then in your mind, you're hearing what the response is and you can negotiate with them yourself, especially if two are in conflict. You know, the one that always wants to go on vacation but the other won't let you, you'll hear them shift states. They can shift in seconds. Person says, oh, I'd love to go on that trip with you. But I should probably save the money. Two different ego states in one sentence. So you can get the two ego states, the one that wants the adventure and the trip and the one that, and you can talk to the two and negotiate it. When they agree, put the two of them together in a stack and that integrates them and bang, the work is done. And it's crazy how simple it is. Oh, I got a question. Yeah, that's uh, Renee. Yeah. Um, 
I'm a hypno baby, just a, and so I'm just starting out. So, and I don't have the cards or anything like that. So now I'm going to talk to my ego things. Can I make myself worse? <laughs> no, yeah, that's a great question. You can't make yourself work. But what you can do okay. is find an ego state that would love to do that particular job and communicate and give that ego state instructions to take over when it would like to do that and do a great job. Example, I freaking hate doing dishes. I hate doing dishes. I mean, it's just one of those things I despise doing. I'm not good at it either. I, you know, they come out half-assed. I, you know, we've got a dishwasher, but there's always the pots and pans that need scrubbing. One day I went, why don't I assign an ego state to this? So I went internally. So I'm looking for an ego state that would love the simple zoning out of listening to music and just casually doing the dishes and feeling the water and the warmth. Oh, one shows up right away. Every time I go to do dishes now, my wife says, honey, could you do it? Yeah. By the time I'm down there, it's already executive. It's putting in rubber gloves, checking water temperature. It Mike, loves doing them. <laughs> Mike, you answered the wrong question. Oh, well, you can get one to do the same thing for your work. No, no, no. you answered, she said, can it, can it, you make it worse, not worse. Oh, I thought you said work, because you said you're a baby. <laughs> okay, well, you just got a free lesson in something completely different, how to do dishes and love it. So <laughs> you're not going to make it worse. No, it's like I've said for years, can you screw somebody up with hypnosis? Yeah, you can, yeah. but you really got to work at making it happen. Uh, so if you just treat it as a fun thing, as an exercise and something, instead of something big and heavy. And uh, what I recommend you do is find, a, find an ego state that would love to work on this with you and help you do a great job with it. So you can two, kill two birds with one stone. Well, no, we don't want to kill birds. We like ravens and crows. Great. Thank you. Oh. How lovely. Well, you know, I, I hate to say it, but it's uh, it's uh, getting to be that uh, time, Mike. Uh, it, it's uh, it is. Gone by, it's gone by so <laughs> very, very quickly. But uh, we we really have appreciated you uh, for, for being here. And uh, so hang on just for a minute before uh, uh, let me make my last announcements. And then we're going to send you off with a big, uh, well, with a big send off. Uh, so mm -hmm. just remember, everybody, the uh, replay is available. I try to get it posted by about noon tomorrow. So uh, at the uh, uh, virtual chapter uh, Facebook group, uh, virtual chapter YouTube channel, and the Mind Matters Forum uh, at uh, IACT or IMDHA's websites, uh, all of those places are where you can find this. And uh, let your friends know about it. It's been a, it's been a lovely talk and I think really uh, helpful information. So, uh, so please uh, pass it on. Uh, Let's be sure and mention that CEUs are available. So contact IACT, IMDHA, or IHF, ICBCH, um, and all friendly organizations. They'll give you a CEUs for being here. Exactly. And in fact, if you tell them, see now, look, we've just spent an hour and a half here. If you tell them it was an hour and a half with Mandel, with Mike Mandel, maybe they'll give you three hours for it. And <laughs> he was here the whole time. So that would be the end. <laughs> I listened in stereo, so uh, I, I, <laughs> Brilliant. I think it as well. Okay, You're well, listen, everybody. Life the way you run it. <laughs> it's, it's been great, and uh, he, so we're going to do what we do, Mike. Uh, that is, uh, we're going to invite everybody to open up their microphones and uh, say goodbye to you all in one great cacophony of love and affection, and we will uh, disappear off into the ether, and thank you again for being with us. Tell us how to get in touch with you, Mike, should someone want to. Mike Mandel, hypnosis.com. And that's one L in Mandel. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.